Thank you. Each year, me and my colleagues, we travel 10,000 kilometers to South Africa. We pack a whole trailer full of equipment and we drive another 600 kilometers into the Kalahari Sands with this, a pile of dung as our end destination. And we have come here for the last 15 years or so trying to understand how an organism with a brain smaller than a rice grain can still manage to run not only one but several compasses in parallel. Of course, we don't come here alone. Our study animals also come here guided by a keen sense of smell and an absolutely unconditional love for dung. This here is a South African dung beetle. Once it has found dung, it digs into it, starts sculpting a ball the size of a golf ball, and starts to roll it away. It rolls it for some 10 to 40 meters before it digs itself and the ball down and consumes it in the safety of the ground. But as it is about to leave the dung pile, this is when trouble might strike. Because other dung beetles are still flying in. And these newly arriving beetles, they don't really know the difference between yours and mine. <laughs> and we'd rather try to steal a ball than to make one of their own. Here you see one of our experimental beetles, number F3, attacking a wild beetle in the field. And even if we don't really see the animals getting hurt by these vicious fights, it does cost a lot of energy. They spend more time out in the sun, they risk being eaten, and ultimately, of course, they risk losing, losing their lunch. So here it might look like the wild beetle eventually won the fight, but F3 attacked again, and one minute later he was the uh, winner of this fight. So what then can a little animal do to try to avoid having its possessions stolen? If we imagine that this here is, is a dung pile, then it's kind of here that all the shit happens. Because this is where we have the dung, this is where all the other beetles are flying in, so this is where they are fighting. A beetle with a ball now wants to get away from this position in space. And it does so by moving in a straight line. Because by moving in a straight line, it makes sure it gets away from the dung pile with every step, and also it's a 100% guarantee that you will not accidentally ever end up there again. The problem is though that no animals, no humans, no beetles can move in a straight line without a compass. And we want to understand how a beetle compass works. In the process of trying to understand this, we have become fashion designers. And I dare to say that we are the only people that have ever designed a hat for a beetle. This is rather difficult. Well, partly because a beetle don't really have a, ha have a head made for wearing a hat, but mostly because our target group doesn't really want to wear our design. And this film here will show you why. This is a beetle rolling with a hat. And very soon you realize this animal cannot move in a straight line. Actually, it comes back to the very point where it started. And this is all because we've added a hat because this totally upsets the orientation system of the beetle. Because their compass works by reading information from the sky, and when the hat is there, they can no longer see it. See, if we put hats on all the beetles over here, total chaos breaks out, because no one can get away from the dung pile, and they just keep on fighting, and there are balls being thrown, and so on. But the question is, of course, what are these animals looking for in the sky? A common compass for many insects, or rather other animals as well, is to use a sun compass. Basically, if I am a dung beetle and we imagine that you are the sun, the beetle can then move straight by just keeping the sun on its left side. But then, 
If I, as a researcher, stand here with a mirror, I can trick this system. I can mirror the sun back from this side instead. Then the beta comes rolling, sun on the left. Suddenly now the sun is on the right. The compass system of beetles has not evolved to cope with researchers with mirrors in the field. So now from the perspective of the beetle, it thinks it's 180 degrees off course and needs to correct for that by turning 180 degrees. And this is what that looks like in the field. And when they see the normal sun again, they will turn back to where they came from. We can continue doing this for as long as we find it fruitful, because as far as the beetle is concerned, they might have a crap day when it comes to orientation, but they try their best to move in a straight line. These are day active beetles. As the sun goes down, these beetles go to bed, and the night shift moves in. Dung restaurants are open 24-7, and nocturnal beetles also need to move poo in a straight line. So they have a compass as well, of course. The moon is there. We can reflect the moon with a mirror. We see the beetles rolling, and only every second, less than every second of, out of these beetles, we now turn. The other one, they just keep on rolling as if we were not there at all. This is because these animals are using something called a nocturnal polarized light compass. And to explain that, we have to start with the moon. As a ray of moonlight travels towards Earth, it vibrates like this in every possible direction. Then it hits the atmosphere. And upon reflection against all the small particles in the atmosphere, it gets polarized. This means it vibrates more in one direction than in the others. So this here would be vertically polarized light, and this here would be horizontally polarized light. To us, it makes no difference. We can't see the difference between these different types of light. To the beetle, it makes all of the difference because formed in the sky is a pattern of polarized light. This here is a photograph taken from the perspective of a beetle. You see the moon at the horizon, and the white arrows is the pattern of polarized light that now, at this time of the night, we find that all the light is polarized in one single direction. The beetle can see this and orient to it. So now, if they, if they turn by 90 degrees, they come off course, they find themselves now being positioned orthogonal to the direction of polarization instead, and then they need to rotate by 90 degrees to find their way back again. In the same way as we can trick an animal using a sun compass, we can also trick these animals. As the beetle is rolling, let's say it's rolling uh, parallel to the direction of pulsation, we then insert a filter over the beetle that rotates that pattern, then the animal will also rotate by 90 degrees. This is what that looks like in the field. Here am I with the filter. And the beetle turns. We don't see any difference in what this filter is doing, but it's obvious to the animal and then comes out under the night sky and turns back again. This is the first film ever taken of an animal using a nocturnal polarized light compass. And these animals are still the only creatures that we know can use this type of compass. Lots of them can use a polarized light compass at day, but these are the only ones that use it at night. So it seems to have evolved with the sole purpose of moving shit in a straight line. Now you can, of course, ask yourself, where is all this information taken care of? Where is the actual compass center of these animals? For that, we have to look at the brain. This white thing here is a dung beetle brain, as you see, several times smaller than the head of a match. We have now started to identify the different sections of this brain, 
And the little green P that you see where the green arrow points, that is the compass center. How do we know this? We know this because we can insert an electrode into this area of the brain and measure the electrical activity as the beetle rotates under the polarized sky. We imagine a beetle standing here under the polarized light pattern. We have an electrode and we can listen and measure the activity of the neurons. Here the activity has been then transformed into sound so you can listen to it or look at it, whatever you prefer. This neuron that you will see the recordings from here has its highest activity when the animal is oriented parallel to the direction of polarization. This is what it sounds like and looks like. High activity, no activity. High activity, no activity. And again, high, no. High, and no. So as the beetle stands there under the night sky, and then if it, it, it will get different signals from its neurons as it is rotating. So it's kind of like high activity, small activity, no activity, high activity, high activity, small activity, no activity, high activity, high activity. So if they want to roll in, let's say, high activity, if they then come, of course, they just have to rotate back to find its high activity and it's back on track again. This kind of rotational movements we can kind of also do when we are using magnetic compass and we find them among the beetles. We call it a dung beetle dance. This is an animal, a day active animals, they dance both day and night. They dance if we reflect the sun. They dance every now and then when they roll on a hockey pitch. <laughs> Falling down an obstacle makes them dance to find their bearing. Hot beetles also dance. This is filmed with a thermal camera. And the best dancers of them all are the guys in caps, because they don't know where to go. <laughs> what happens then if the sun is well, <laughs> the moon is well below the horizon, there is no polarized light left in the sky, only the stars remain, and on these dark nights, we find our beetles to be lost. They can no longer roll in straight lines, and I guess on these dark nights, they do best by just staying underground. So by that, I've reached the end of the beetle compass. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, this is, this is where I would have stopped this talk a few years ago. But then we found something <laughs> that first confused us and then amazed us. Because when we repeated these experiments seven years later, they were no longer lost. We could see our animals moving out in straight paths. Obviously, seven years is nothing on the evolutionary scale of a beetle. They couldn't have evolved a new type of compass. We must have done something wrong. We came back again the next year. They could still roll straight. The only thing they had to look at now was the starry sky. Traditionally, insects are not known to be able to see stars. They're just too small for their little eyes to perceive. So we were greatly confused. We decided to take our beetles on a city trip. We put them in a trailer and drove them back to Johannesburg and let them roll in the Johannesburg planetarium. Again, they were doing just fine. So we took out all the lights in the planetarium, including the emergency signs, and the beetles were lost. They were obviously using something in a the sky they couldn't see. So, seeing from the perspective of a beetle that they have a less detailed view of the world compared to ours, the starry sky in South Africa might look something like this. The white fuzzy band you see here is the Milky Way that is very obvious in the Southern Hemisphere. So even if they can't see the, their stars themselves, maybe they can still see this band of light and orient to it and find their bearing 
using this band of light. Turns out it was exactly like that. We could show them the Milky Way in the planetarium and they were doing just fine. Why did we miss this seven years earlier? This was because then we did our experiments in October when the Milky Way is close to the horizon. Then we repeated the experiments in February when the Milky Way was high up in the zenith. So in a way, we had done the perfect control experiment seven years before we did the actual test. <laughs> beetles, the, our dung beetles, are still the only insects in the world that are known to be able to use stars for their orientation. It's the only animals in the world that we know can use the Milky Way for their orientation. But I am sure there are many more animals out there that can do similar things. Finally, I will have to admit that what I've told you so far is not completely true. Because there are animals that can move in a straight line without a compass, and they are all women. Because <laughs> when a male beetle gets amorous, he makes a really large dung ball, then he attracts the female, and if she likes what she sees, she can jump up onto the ball and just sits there. He gets through all the pushing, all the orienting, all the dancing, while she just sits there absolutely motionless, moving in a straight line. So obviously, if it is lazy and clever enough, there are alternative solutions to all problems, even from the perspective of a beetle. Thank you. <laughs>